Proverbs 7. You go from Proverbs 7, verse 1, and into Proverbs chapter 8, I think through verse 14, we will see that that's the plan. Lord, I pray that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1 says, My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Once again, God tells us to treasure up His commandments or treasure up His word. It's so important that we do that. If you think that saving money is important because that enhances your life, then you ought to store the word up inside of your soul because... It's worth much more than money, as we will see in a few minutes here. And it will enhance your life, not only more than money, but having the words stored up inside of you will enhance your life more than anything else in this world could possibly do. You know, it's just having the Word of God inside of you, it just does remarkable things, especially when unexpected things happen, bad things happen, or you're facing death or whatever. If you have the Word of God in you, It is just such a treasure in so many ways. Providing comfort and answers. It's a a huge blessing and a good reason to store it up. Verse 2, keep my commandments and live. Keep my teachings as the apple of your eye. There is no part of the body, I don't believe, that is so automatically protected by the other parts of our body more than the eye. Isn't that true? You will sacrifice, at least I will, I will sacrifice without even thinking about it any part of my body to protect my eye. If something is flying toward my eye, I will sacrifice my hand gladly or my arm or anything or duck my head or turn or even your eyelid shutting automatically when something is coming close to your eye Look at how that is built right into us to protect your eye, protect the apple of your eye. And I suppose it's that way because we value our sight so much and because our sight adds such a good quality to our lives. And so we protect it. God says in the same way that you would protect your eye, in the same way that you do protect your eye, guard your obedience to Christ because that is really the key to abundant living. That is the key to an abundant life. And so, think about that. Guard your obedience to Christ with the same intensity that you guard your eye. That is what God is saying right here. Keep them like the apple of your eye. Verse 3, Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. To bind the Word of God on your fingers means to let the Word of God control everything that you do. Your hand or your fingers speak of what you do. And when God says, bind my word to your fingers, He's saying, let my word guard or guide everything that you do. Let it determine everything that you do. Verse 4, Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend. Wisdom, in other words, should be respected as much as you would respect a close friend or a relative. Guard your relationship with God. Guard your relationship with wisdom like you would a close friendship. And respect wisdom like you would respect a close family member or father or grandfather or somebody like that. Give it that kind of honor. Give it that kind of respect. Verse 5. Actually, look at verse 4 and 5 together. It says, Say to wisdom, You are my sister and call insight your intimate friend to preserve you from the loose woman, from the adventurous with her smooth words. This is really something because God has been talking about loose women now for at least the last few chapters. This is the third week in a row I know He's talked about it. He's going to talk about it again in detail in just a few minutes. But He says, He talks about God's Word preserving you from that type of a woman with her flattery. Last week, God talked about the batting of their eyes. 
and not to be influenced by the batting of the eyes of a loose woman. This time it's the flattery of the loose woman. It doesn't matter if it's batting eyes or flattery of a loose woman. The, the fact is, when a woman like that uses flattery or does bat her eyes to a man, to some men anyway, not to all men, but to some men, that is like dangling a worm in front of a bluegill. It is like they are captured by that. Some men are captured by that anyway. In a situation like that, God says you've got to listen to wisdom. Listen to what wisdom is telling you when something like that happens to you. Listen to wisdom because wisdom will be saying, look beyond the eyes, mister. Look beyond the flattery. Look beyond, in other words, that big juicy worm and notice the hook because believe me, there's a hook there. And that is a message to any man, any young man, any teenage boy that is listening to me or watching me right now. Look beyond. Look beyond the flattery. Look beyond the batting of the eyes. Look beyond the beauty and notice the hook. God is warning Verse 6. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice. Let's stop right there for a second. The writer is about to tell a story of a harlot and a young man who was taken in by her. Look at verse 7. He's looking out his window. And verse 7 says, I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man without sense, this young man that is referred to here in verse 7, I think you will see, is just a, just a naive guy, probably from a small town, visiting the big city for the first time. He doesn't know anything about anything. He doesn't have any street smarts at all. He, he's not a hardcore sinner. You're going to see that. He's not a hardcore sinner. He's just an inexperienced small-time guy who isn't ready for what he's about to experience and, and he's going to be caught up in it because of it. God wants to give people like that experience. Experience through his word. Experience without the years and without the hardship that comes from learning the hard way. And so that's the kind of guy that we're dealing with here. Just an inexperienced small time guy, small town guy visiting the big city for the first time. Look at verse 8. Passing along the street near her corner taking the road to her house. Stop right there for a second. His first mistake? His first mistake was being in the red light district. He was in the wrong part of town. Don't know that he knew where he was? Doesn't matter. He was in the wrong part of town, though. He was in the red light district or the equivalent of it in that day. The best way to avoid sin is to stay as far away from the temptation as you can possibly stay away from it. That is where a life sold out to Jesus Christ really is helpful. Because if you are, if you are, if you are living a life sold out to Christ, that will protect you from many sins because it will keep you occupied doing good things. See? It will keep you away from the things that you shouldn't be around. You'll be so occupied doing what God wants you to do that you'll be in the right place doing the right things won't give you the opportunity to be in the wrong places doing the wrong things. See? You're filling your life with positive things. You're not going to put yourself in a situation where you shouldn't be. And that's what the Bible means in part when it says overcome evil with good. You've got to fill that gap with something good. Otherwise, for sure, if you're not filling it with something good, you'll be in the wrong place doing the wrong things, being tempted to do the wrong things. So this boy, this man, his first mistake was to be in the wrong place. But he didn't stop there. Look at verse 9. In the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. So he's not only in the wrong place, he's also there at the wrong time. Horsing around in the red light district after dark is just asking for trouble. Now can't you just see this naive young guy walking down the street and turns the wrong corner and here he is? Wrong place, wrong time. You are just asking for trouble being in a situation like that. You are walking right into temptation. The worst place in the world for a young man to be. Being in a red light district after dark is like putting on a porno movie. It's like looking at a Playboy magazine or a Hustler magazine or something like that. 
It's just in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. It's like a mosquito buzzing around one of those blue lights that looks so inviting and so comforting and you get too close all of a sudden zap! It's too late. You're dead. You're fried. That's how fast it happens. Verse 10. And lo, a woman meets him dressed as a harlot wily of heart. And so he meets a harlot who is dressed to kill and all painted up to be noticed. And boy, she sure catches his eye. He'd never seen anything like this before. You know, not where he came from. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And look it, it resulted in him looking at the wrong thing. It resulted in him seeing the wrong thing. And when you give temptation that much of a head start, it's hard to hold back. You can hold back. You can back out of it. But it's a, it's a lot harder. You've got to call on the name of Jesus and you might have to call on the name of Jesus 50 or 60 times in a row and God will give you victory. And you can back out of a situation like that. But it's just a whole lot easier to fight temptation by not putting yourself into a situation like that to begin with. And so notice the progression. Wrong place, wrong time. Now he's looking at the wrong thing. Look at verse 11. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. And there is absolutely nothing modest about this woman at all, is there? Nothing modest about her. She is loud, and she is brash, and she is calling attention to herself. She's very easy to see, very easy to spot by this young man and by any man who happened to be walking by, and that's exactly the way she wants it to be. She wants to be spotted. She wants attention drawn her way. And uh, sin is like that, isn't it? All sin is like that. Sin is like that. It is very easy to find sin. You don't have to go looking for sin. Sin will come your way. Satan will make sure that temptation comes your way. It will just come your way. You don't have to look for it. It's very easy to find. Verse 13. She seizes him and kisses him. Wow. That's something he's never experienced. He'd never seen anybody like this, but now all of a sudden she grabs him and kisses him. No woman back home, wherever he was from, ever showed this much interest in this guy. I guarantee you that. And so no doubt he's really taken back. And look at the last part of verse 10, 13. And with impudent face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So stop right there for a second. She's talking about her sacrifices and her vows. And so this young guy, he's probably thinking, man, she's religious. She's a religious woman. Look, she's talking about God. You know, seems kind of loose. Never met a woman like that. Never saw a woman act like that. But man, she must be all right. I mean, because she's talking about God, and she's re- she's obviously very religious. She pays her vows. She makes her religious offerings. And that kind of reminds this guy probably of his mother back home. You know, gives him a feeling of security. She must be all right. Must be all right. Look at verse fifteen. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly. And I have found you. Did you, no, did you notice the three you's in this verse? Unbelievable. I've come out to meet you. I've come out to seek you. And now I have found you. In other words, what she is saying is, you are the one that I have been waiting for. Man, I finally found you. You are, the, you are just the perfect guy that I have been waiting for. None like you. You are it. That's what she's saying. What a liar. She would have said that to any guy who would have walked by her. He just happened to be the one. But now, since he is naive and since he is inexperienced, he's probably thinking, well, gee, there's something special about me. She, she thinks I'm really something. She thinks I'm important. And so look at verse 16. She's talking yet. I have decked my couch with coverings colored spreads of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Well, 
if he wasn't thinking what she wanted him to be thinking before, he is now. Because this is what you call a not so subtle, not so subtle hint as she describes her bed. Verse 18. She says, Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. And so she makes it sound as if it's going to be great. It's just going to be wonderful. It's all pleasure. This is a golden opportunity for you, Bister. You know, you can't, you can't squander this opportunity here. Verse 19. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. In other words, there's no danger of getting caught. You can't go wrong with this, is what she is saying to him. No danger of getting caught. Yeah, and if he wasn't brought up to know that there is a God in heaven who sees everything that he does, and that there is a God in heaven who will hold him accountable for everything that he does, he's going to buy her lie too. And he's going to think, yeah, I guess there is no way that we can get caught. I guess there's no harm in doing this because your husband's not home. He'll never find out. Doesn't matter if God knows. Look at verse 21. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. And so her her words, if he had any inhibitions when this first started, her words are just melting all those inhibitions away now. They are slowly disappearing. This temptation is really starting to spin out of control very quickly. Verse 22. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast. Look at God's, look at God's description of this. What a different picture he paints than Satan. Satan through the woman paints a picture of pleasure and fulfillment and happiness. And it's all a facade. It's all a lie. Satan just wants to destroy this young man's life and destroy this young man's soul. And you can, you can listen to Satan if you want to. When he says it'll be fun, it'll be a good time, it's pleasure, you won't be accountable, there's no price to pay for it. But if I were you, I would listen to God's description. Because he says he's going like an animal to a slaughter. That's what reality is. That just cuts through the facade, doesn't it? God gets right, right down to the heart of the matter and tells us exactly what this kid is headed for, what this young man is headed for. He's moving toward pain and he's moving toward punishment. And he thinks he's moving toward pleasure. Verse 23, Till an arrow pierces his entrails as a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And so for these few moments of pleasure that he no doubt you know, will experience, those few moments of pleasure are going to come with a high price tag. Venereal disease and AIDS and judgment from God and disgrace and embarrassment and guilt and shame and maybe scandal when eventually word gets out what he did. All that bad because of the few moments of pleasure. And he's going to regret this the rest of his life is what God is saying. Look at verse 24. And now, O sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. Hold it right there for a second. God says, let not your heart turn aside to her ways. You know what God is saying? Don't even go in that direction in your mind. Don't allow yourself to even move in that direction. Don't, don't even want to be with somebody who is like this. And when God says, let not your heart turn aside to her ways, what he is saying is the moment a guy even has a slight desire to associate with a woman like this, he needs to call on the name of Jesus and let Christ cleanse him of that desire immediately. Don't even play with a desire like that. Don't think about it. Don't dwell on it. 
Don't fantasize about it. Call on Jesus and help Him to get rid of that or ask Him to get rid of it and He will get rid of it for you. That's what it means when He says, let not your heart turn aside to her desires. Heart means your mind, your thoughts. God says, don't go that direction, even in your mind. 26. Look at this, hey. 26 and 27. For many a victim she has laid low. Yea, all her slain are a mighty host. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Notice what God says here in verse 26. Many a victim she has laid low. Her slain are a mighty host. She, in other words, has used her old, worn out, but very effective line on a lot of guys for a long time. God says, many souls she are res- is responsible for slain. Still a very effective line. And that's why she uses it. The batting of the eyes, the flattery, that all that garbage. Just an instrument of Satan to drag this young man down. Just one more notch on her gun belt, as it were. She has ruined many lives according to the Word of God. You know, any guy, any guy who would think that an aggressive woman like this, who's coming on strong to him, like this woman is coming on so strong to this young man, any guy who would think that a woman like that has never done it before with anybody else, better think again. Believe me. She has done it before with many other men. And after she's done ruining your life, she will do it with many other men after you as well. You can't trust a woman who is loud, brash, and comes on strong. You cannot trust a woman like that. That is a warning to any guy listening. Don't think that you're something special. She may talk to you like you are something special. And she will make you think that that you are the only one. Don't you believe her? Listen to what God is saying. Remember his warning here. The Bible in the New Testament talks about a godly woman not being loud, not being brash, not being forward. That's not a godly woman. God says the mark of a godly woman is a gentle and quiet and holy spirit. That's the kind of woman that you want to look for if you're a Christian man. Notice how God warns. And notice how nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in what? 3,000 years? Nothing has changed. Those kind of women are still like that today. And so God's warning is still relevant for today. Let's go into chapter 8. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? Now, remember when I, I talked about this a, lot, a few times, and I will keep reminding you of this. Whenever you see the word wisdom, especially, well, I'm not going to say especially in the book of Proverbs, but whenever you see the word wisdom, you could, sub, um, what's the word? Substitute it for Jesus. Because the Bible says that Jesus has been made unto us wisdom from God. And the Bible also says that all the treasuries of wisdom are found in Christ Jesus. So actually this first verse could be could read this way. Does not Jesus call? Does not understanding or does not Jesus raise his voice? And I just wanted you to see the, the contrast because just like sin is pictured calling out in chapter 7, here wisdom, that is Christ, calls out to us in chapter 8. Verse 2. On the heights, beside the way, in the path she takes her stand, besides the gate, in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. And so the list of places where wisdom can be found is God's way of saying she can be found anywhere. Wisdom can be found anywhere. 
Jesus can be found anywhere, is what he is saying. Anywhere you are, Jesus is. And anywhere you are, God's wisdom is available. If you just have your ears open to his voice. Verse 4. O you, or excuse me, verse 4. To you, O men, I call. And my cry is to the sons of men. O simple ones, learn prudence. O foolish men, pay attention. Christ wants to save every single person on this earth. And God wants to help guide every single person on this planet. Every single one without exception. As you can see it right here in verses 4 and 5, wisdom from God is seen crying out to the sons of men. That means he's crying out to anybody who will listen. And God loves everyone. And the Bible says in the New Testament that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he's crying out to everyone. The call is going out to the whole world to repent, turn to God. Verse 6, Here, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Did you notice the character? Did you notice the character of God's teaching? Look at the list that he he gives us here in verses 6 through 9. The character of wisdom, the character of God's teaching. God never teaches anything that isn't true, anything that isn't right, anything that isn't good for us. And his wisdom never communicates anything that isn't true, right, or what is good for us. Now, what God says sometimes does not set well with our sin nature. It doesn't always set well with our sin nature. You guys know that. But it is always good for us. It's always the right thing. Verse 10. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. People prize jewels and people prize wealth. But to somebody who has discernment, they know that God's word is a lot more valuable than any of those things. It's not even close. Look at verse 12. I wisdom dwell in prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. God equates wisdom with prudence and he equates wisdom with discretion. And what he is saying is that wisdom and discretion or wisdom and being thrifty or wisdom and the ability to make the right choices and wisdom and the ability to to handle the affairs of everyday life in the right way, those things go hand in hand. When, when you're learning from God and you're full of God's wisdom and full of God's word, you will have the ability to make the right choices. And, you know, the little choices, they are so important. That's why you just cannot... underestimate the value of the Word of God you know, in your life. Because as you fill yourself with the Word of God, it gives you that discretion, it gives you that prudence, that ability to discern and make the right choices. And it all starts, a good quality of life starts with the small choices that you make. And you know, a lot of times, if you are filling yourself with the Word of God, God the Holy Spirit is leading you And he is bringing into your remembrance things that you have read and you are making right decisions without you even thinking about it. You know, it just becomes an automatic thing because you're so full of the Word of God. And those little choices that you make day by day, throughout the day, they may not seem that big to you, but they they are so important to make the small choices the right choices. Because if you do the little things right, the big things are going to take care of themselves. And if you follow God, if you follow God second by second, the big picture is going to work out. You know? The big plan is going to fall into place for you. But it all starts with those little choices. And flooding yourself with the Word will help you to make the right ones. Verse 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. 
And there are certain things that God just will not live with and cannot live with. With Pride is incompatible with God and lying and wickedness and all forms of evil. These things are all just the moral opposite of God's Word, the moral opposite of God, and that's why you cannot have fellowship with anybody who lives like that. Verse 14. And I stop with this. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. If you live for Jesus, you take in the Word, you live for Jesus, He will give you wisdom, and He will give you a benefit package. Along with that wisdom, He will give you a benefit package that no company could possibly even come close to giving you. Wall Street could not possibly come close to giving you a benefit package like the one Jesus will give you if you live for Him. Because Jesus will give you good counsel. He will give you understanding. He will give you good sense. He will give you real common sense. He will give you moral strength to know the right thing and moral strength to be able to do the right thing. That all comes. It's a package that Jesus gives us when we walk with Him and we fill ourselves with the Word. That's the package that He gives you. And you know how wonderful that is? Because those are the very things that will give you a good life in this world and in the one to come. Enhance your life. 